There All right. Go. So uh, I, for anyone that just came in, uh, Kathy has gone, I think, to Vermont. Her daughter has a dissertation, I think, tomorrow. So, But she plans to be joining us, might, might be just a little later. So I'll do my best to carry on with the agenda. Um, so our first uh, agenda item will be to approve, let me see, where am I? Approve the minutes of November 11th, 2021. And I think everyone was there in November, right here. So I would, I would entertain a motion if anybody's ready to do so. Motion to approve. Okay, second. I don't know if we have to, do we, do we approve? I don't think we really do, right? All right, well, let's see who, Dur neither Durlin nor I are voting members of this committee. Right, so and I don't know. Joe, if are you a voting member or no? No, so. So actually, you don't have, maybe you have to delay those because we don't have a quorum. I think we can get one more. When Kathy comes in, if that we can do that. time, I think you could approve them then. So okay. We to defer that. Sounds good. Um, so then we have, uh, last night we had another community engagement event with Consolidated Communications. And I know Kendra Joe, you were there. Matt, you were there. Um, I was not, apologies, I missed that. Yeah, no, that's all right. And I, I'm not sure, I don't think Darlin was either. So um, Kendra Joe, do you wanna give a quick synopsis maybe just for Pete's and Darlin's? Sure, yeah, and I know that there's, I know there's a recording um, available and I think uh, the slide that could easily be available for what use it is. Um, yeah, so um, there were a couple of new faces um, on the call, but it was a small group and Sarah Davis and um, Simon, oh, whose last name is slipping my mind, but Simon um, was there from Consolidated. He's not new to Consolidated, but very new to the position he's in. He's replacing Jeff Nevins, who some had talked to in the past. Um, Simon Thorne. Simon Thorne, that. thank you. Um, and, you know, they gave an overview of their service, unfortunately, on the entire island, um, because of, they have three central offices, they said, so it's not a central office per town, it's three for the entire island, so it's hard for them to kind of break up where they are providing service um, within town borders. Um, so they, they did give an overview of that. They do, they gave an overview of kind of their approach to community, their approach to building out infrastructure. They're looking at entirely, um, entire fiber build outs moving forward, really moving away from copper DSL, you know, what exists, especially in places where they're the provider of last resort, they have to maintain but they're not looking to continue to implement copper or go to coax. They are just going right to, to fiber to the premise um, expansions. They do pretty well seeking federal funds. They are actively engaged in seeking state funds um, and have kind of moved forward under the new policies of the state to be able to do so, yeah, either alone or with communities. Um, and they have their own strategic investment as well. When asked a little bit more about that, specific to Mount Desert Island, they do have some, some investment to um, replace and expand their fiber footprint in the Bar Harbor area, but not in other towns. Um, they have both partnered with communities to do full you know, where they own the, they own the infrastructure, they provide the service, but the community really brings in some community engagement, buy-in, supports the state application. Um, but they, at least in New Hampshire, we haven't really seen this play out fully in Maine, which they, try, they, they tried with Long Island, but um, I like the way they characterize it, but um, it, it, it just didn't move forward as a municipally owned build. Um, it, it's now a fully consolidated owned build. But they have in New, in New Hampshire at least participated on a municipally owned infrastructure. They're one of the few national providers in Maine who have done so. Um, and so they're open to those conversations. I think for this group, you know, next, next steps are you can continue these conversations with them. They definitely are an option because they are an incumbent, um, but they also encourage regional efforts um, because of economies of scale 
because it's network infrastructure, because of the way that they are set up within the communities. Um, but yeah, I think overall it was a good call. And even for a small group, I thought it was, um, there were some good questions that were, were raised. Andrew, in those instances where it's a municipal, I'm assuming the municipality then would lease it to one of those companies rather than try to run it themselves. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. So nowhere in Maine have we seen a community try to be their own provider. And any anytime you kind of see municipally owned systems fail, it's it's talking about really large urban areas, um, mostly out in California, Utah area that tried to the city tried to compete as a provider in an already oversaturated community with five to ten providers actively seeking um, profit in the in that city. So in Maine, what it is is the town owns the infrastructure just like you would own a road. And then they lease, they partner with an internet service provider to operate and manage that infrastructure. So the provider is lighting it up as an internet service provider. They're managing the equipment, any of the upgrades, any of the technical issues. They're also um, managing any of the break fixes. So if a line goes down, if if something needs replaced, they're they're doing all of that. And in a contract, it's typically a 12 to 20 year contract and you have off ramps. So you have the ability to switch providers or network operators at any point. Thank you, that sounds interesting. Could you give a high level, quick understanding of what is the benefit to the municipality in this regard for owning the, owning the fiber um, and leasing it, leasing the oper leasing it to to consolidate for operations and maintenance, versus having consolidated own the fiber. Is there a protection in terms of like lock in on price, or are there other benefits? Yeah, so you have a lot more control as a municipality over set pricing. You have control over who your provider is on that system, whether it's an open or closed access network. So if you have one or multiple providers on that network. Um, I mean, you control who's on it and how they're participating on it. The other aspect is that you then own a revenue generating asset as a town. Um, so in time, the the goal is, and, and so far every community that we've seen model out um, municipally owned, except for Islesboro, which did this purposefully, um, we have seen the subscribers pay back any town bond debt of, as you increase the take rate. So then once the bond debt is paid off, you then have a revenue generating asset that if it's complete fiber to the premise, the fiber at least won't have to be replaced within a, a generation at least. Um, some of the you know, central office equipment does have lifespan issues of five, 10, 15 years, but the fiber itself is um, multi-generational. So that's, is those are kind of the two biggest things. I mean, for towns, it's, it gets, if they get to that point, and usually they get to that point because incumbents aren't willing to work with them um, around their set goals. If they do get to that point, it's typically a, if we're gonna invest taxpayer dollars, why would we subsidize a, a private business, which will have no control over pricing affordability and service when we could invest more and own, a, own an asset? So more control, and investment in an asset that could bring returns to the town. And then my last question is, was Consolidated, in your opinion, more willing to work with us as a municipality in this regard than Spectrum? Did this even come up with Spectrum? So Spectrum has not participated on a municipally owned network in Maine. Um, and, and not to say that that's what you're considering, but if that is a pathway for a community, Spectrum has not been willing to be a provider on a municipally owned system that we've seen. Consolidated has, they do it a little bit different than Axiom or GWI or um, Pioneer does, but they at least are willing to have the conversation. Um, I would say at the end of the day, most providers prefer to own their own asset. There's only one provider in Maine that I can think of that doesn't have a business model in which they prefer to own their own assets. Um, they prefer to be a provider on someone else's equipment. But for the most part, if you're if you're just comparing those two on that one thing, consolidated is more likely to be on a town owned own system than Spectrum at this at least at this time. But we would have options like Charter. I mean, excuse me, uh, GWI Pioneer Consolidated. So there's a couple you could potentially do an RFP um, 
and kind of get a bit of a bidding war on who would who would come and give us the best service and and so on. Yeah, yeah, you have non incumbents, um, you know, who you, ha you haven't necessarily dug into conversations with yet um, that have different approaches to community driven broadband and how and when they operate on their own systems or other systems. If they only want, like GWI is looking to mostly do regional partnerships now instead of town by town. Um, differences in affordability, differences in kind of the way they build out fiber. Um, so each one's a, each one's a little different, uh, but there are options beyond your incumbents. I would say at least in the last month or two, we've definitely seen an incumbent like Spectrum um, be very reactive to communities going down, to a community in which they're in, going down a municipally owned pathway. We haven't, we hadn't seen that up until now. In the last six years, they haven't done anything. What do you mean reactive? They started putting up more fiber on their network? Um, they have, and, and I'm, I'm happy to share the, the news articles with you, but they have um, supported anti, kind of anti-municipally owned organizations who then put out a lot of, um, you know, do door door to door knocking and phone calls and um, pamphlets around a town vote specifically. Um, this happened in Leeds, Hampton, and China. Um, up until this time, we haven't we hadn't seen them do anything. Um, but they, you know, they did it and said, "We are now offering to build out the entire community or to build out, you know, the gaps of service." Um, there is no timeline on that statement, though. If they were seeking state funding, they'd have a year timeline to build out um, in a place like Hampton, where TDS and Spectrum both kind of came around and in light of the vote um, or before the vote and said, you know, we're we're going to build out the entire community with fiber uh, where we aren't serving currently. There's no timeline on when that will happen. So I think people are watching that pretty closely because it's it's the biggest kind of statement they've said um, so far. But it's just a it's just a changing of tides. Um, you know, the other thing is, I, I I think before last night, I would have thought that there's there's no competition for Spectrum, but I really felt like uh, consolidated. It sounds like they're really rebranding. Um, it sounds like you know I was surprised to hear they what they say they own fifty percent of all the polls. Um, and um, she also talked about how where they are building out that they're they're running fiber into the homes for nothing, right? That's what she was also saying. So I, I think they're a real player. I really do. And that probably lights fire under under yeah. spectrum too. They've definitely consolidated has definitely changed their approach in the last year and a half. And part of that is to seek and leverage funding, mm -hmm. both state and federal. And you know, I've, I've heard Sarah say before, fiber doesn't actually cost them more to put in. It's just, it costs the labor, takes a little bit more if you're taking your infrastructure off the pole and putting new infrastructure on. But the equipment itself, fiber versus copper, doesn't cost them more, um, which has always been an argument by, by some providers in the past that it just, it costs an outlandish amount up front, even though the maintenance long-term isn't there. Um, but yeah, they've definitely changed um, their approach to community, their value and community partnership. Um, and some of that also, I think, is with the strategic investment that they received. Um, a third party investor uh, came in and, and a lot of that's coming to New England. A lot of, the, of that is coming to Maine, but they are very much you know, replacing and expanding in their current footprint with that investment. And so their approach is, if we're going to do that already with that strategic investment, how do we leverage other funding to then expand? So Eastport, for example, we know that Eastport's on their work plan for 2025, 2024, 2025. They are going to upgrade the downtown with fiber, but there will still be consolidated customers outside of that premise dense area that have will have uh, you know under one over one service on DSL so it's how do we work with the community how do we partner to expand to reach the entire community of eSport knowing that they're already going to be doing labor you know work and have their labor force 
right there during that time frame. I sort of echo what Scott said. I think uh, I was really a little bit surprised, pleasantly surprised, I should say. Um, they definitely seem more flexible, and maybe this is just because of the sort of network they build without the the hindrance of including the coax. They seem much more flexible. Their business model to me, it seems like they're open um, to different options. And I have to say, we met with them, I think right before they became consolidated, uh, what, four or five years ago, I think. And they were trying to find a buyer at the time, so they weren't spending any money. And it was, it was almost a a sad meeting <laughs> with their old DSL. I was I was really impressed with them, I have to say. I think we should definitely keep in touch with them regardless of what we end up doing. Mm -hmm. Kathy, anything you wanted to add about them? Well, I thought, I agree with you, Scott. I was pleasantly surprised. I had been discounting consolidated all along the way and until I had heard that they actually own a fair amount of the of the fiber across the state and are focusing on communities to do fiber to the premises in, in some communities. And so I think that it's a very viable option for us. And I think at some point we're gonna need as a committee to say, this is what we wanna do. We wanna follow up on that recommendation from Tilson from 2015 to say, we want this, we want fiber to the premises and now let's figure out how we're gonna get it and where the money's gonna come from and who is it that we're gonna work with to make this happen. Whether it's municipally owned, but if there was another option, I think everybody would prefer that other option. And so Consolidated could be a great partner in that. And I'm sorry to be late. Um, we just, I, I'm gonna do a little bragging here. I, I'm late because we're in Vermont right now and uh, my middle daughter, Nora, just uh, did her, presentation on her dissertation for her PhD in public health from Harvard. And broadband internet capacity was a big question <laughs> whether this was gonna work because it was all by Zoom and there were people from all over the country and her team is all over the place as well. And so it's nice to know Maine is not alone but Waterbury, Vermont has some broadband issues as well. So, you know. <laughs> is that uh, wine I see that you've been drinking over there? Champagne. Champagne. <laughs> We're having champagne. Congratulations. Congrats. So I hope somebody else is taking notes. And sorry, I am. Recorded, but but. I think Scott will take credit for those early years that Nora had, I think. There yeah. you go. So before I forget it, though, we didn't have a quorum before. To, do we have to vote on the minutes, Kathy? Approve? Uh, we should. We should yeah. vote on the minutes, yes. So Pete had um, made a motion to accept the minutes of November 11th. Are you willing to second? Second it, yes. Happy to second that. All in favor? All three of us. <laughs> All three of us, exactly. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to move on to update on uh, Vetro, update on Vetro Cares for mm -hmm. Maine program. Okay, so I'm up for that. And so Vetro created a cohort three group. I think they reached out to people who had participated in cohort one and two, and we were part of cohort two. They have new staff involved. They're in increasing their capacity, I think. And I think that they wanna delve a little deeper into how they're going to be helping us. And so there's going to be more training and more connections with professionals in terms of what direction we wanna go in and what professionals we might wanna tap into to get support to follow whatever path we determine. So um, I think that they're doing this with help from uh, Connect Maine Authority funding to, to make this all possible. And so um, we expect that you know, this, will, this will be a benefit to us. Uh, one of the things that we had wondered about with them was the information about uh, poll attachments, make ready expenses, et cetera, because that is an issue for every community across the town, which is why we asked both Spectrum and Consolidated, you know, do you own the polls? How does that work? Can you share that information? And so knowing that every community is going through this, I think Vetro is trying to reach out to the poll owners. And it seems now as though it is, it's a 50-50 share between the electric company and the phone company, which is now Consolidated. So as she described it yes, uh, earlier this week, they own 50% of all the polls. So I imagine that it's just between the two. They are 
Vetro is, is appealing to the poll owners to make that information available to them so they can use it um, as, they, as they do planning. So I think that that will be an advantage to us if it comes to fruition. So, um, so they're, that's it. They're, they're beefing up what they're going to be doing. It should help us in the long run uh, become a little better trained and use the platform more effectively. So, so I wonder, Kathy, if, um, if Consolidated owns 50% of the polls, Spectrum owns 0% of the polls, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we be going knocking on the door consolidated and say, give us a plan. Exactly, a I would agree. And I wonder, I mean, since, so we've been in our house here for a long time, you know, 30 years, and this is the third phone company that is there. It started off with Verizon, it went to Fairpoint, and now it's consolidated. Is consolidated gonna stay a good long while? Or is it like the electric company, we're also on our third electric company from right. Bangor Hydro to Emera to now Versant. So there's a lot of changes in those ownerships. And can we count on either of the current two staying? We know our electric rates are going up. Um, <laughs> I just wonder about counting on them, but I, I completely agree. Why would we wanna bother with working with Spectrum if the, the phone company is invested in this and it is fiber, not coax cable? So then the two major ways forward would be either we try to encourage consolidated to commit to a full fiber build out of the town, or we work with Vetro and get make ready information from consolidated to get a sense of what's the timing and cost for us to do a municipal fiber build out with a commitment or, and then start exploring um, maintenance and operation from a service provider like consolidated. Is there a fair assessment, like the two paths in front of us? I guess one thing that Vetro has done so far is provided a design for a fiber to the premises plan. So there is, there's a design there for what the main roads look like, how many splitters you need, how you access each house. And so there's a design there. The question is, is there already fiber in some of those locations. So we don't need that full thing. So, but, and we don't know where that is now. Um, and you're right, who's going to do it? Who's gonna do the legwork and who's gonna pay for it? How, or how are we gonna pay for it? Um, and I think that that's where Casco Bay Advisors comes in, right? I mean, that's what we wanted him to do was take a closer look at what exists. So we have a better understanding of where there is fiber already so that we can figure out where there are gaps and what we still need to fill in. Um, and sorry, I was late. Was there already an update on, on Casco? No, we're, actually it might be a good transition. Okay. Uh, Durlin just gave me a little update before we came on, but um, Durlin, why don't you just talk yeah. about what we chatted about, so. Basically, I think what I had said earlier, it's come to fruition that I did move some of that money from last fiscal year over to this fiscal year. And there should be uh, money in, into the uh, community development budget to be able to fund you know, that study from them. So I'd like to, to see the parameters and the costs of it, but I don't, I don't see why we couldn't uh, proceed with that. And how would we do that, Durling? Do we just, we need approval from the Board of Selectmen to engage in that contract? Yeah. Uh, yes, you need uh, permission for them to engage in it. Um, if it's under $10,000, I can take care of the money without their support or, or without their approval of actually having to, to fund the contract. But the concept has to be there. And I'm assuming that they would want to get a ballpark figure of what that would cost. And Brian's very good at that way. I mean, and I think it... It was just under ten thousand dollars. It was like yeah. ninety six hundred dollars. Yeah. So if it's if it stays under ten, then I can do that by myself. If it goes over ten, then they have to go back and actually do the the contract approval as well. So so I think we should get an update. When I sent him that, uh, you asked me to do that follow up of whether the prices had held, and he said they had. Mm -hmm. So and thank so, you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we, we shouldn't have to worry about <clears throat> a renegotiation of any type. So, so I think uh, basically, uh, probably broadband committee ought to go before the selectmen and say, you know, we're ready to take this step. Will you approve us doing it? And see what they say. So help me unte tease some things out because I'm still a little confused about what Casco consultants does and what Metro will is doing. You know, I, I'm still trying to figure teasing that out. Who could do that for me? Um, I can pipe in a little bit and anybody correct me if I'm wrong here, but Vetro, if you have a, if you have a real project, you can keep track of it on the Vetro platform. So it's a GIS mapping. So you can identify where every specific pole is and what you would need to attach it and attach things to the poles and attach things to the house. So you can see, you can plot where every building is as well. Um, but it's a, it's a design that would achieve the objective of a fiber to the premises. What Brian would be doing is identifying where all the poles are and what would be needed to do this on the ground. Um, and, and from that, we, I think we would have enough information to go out out to bid on something. So we would, we would see where there already is fiber, where there's this or that, um, and, and come up with a, a real plan. But um, Brian's, Brian's proposal for us is in our folder. Um, if you would expand on the knowledge that Vetro already has. Right. And we combine these two sources of information. We have a pretty clear picture of truth on the ground and potential costs and, and bill of materials and so on. Yeah, it should basically what Vetro is doing is providing the raw materials that Brian could take and actually transfer into an engineering study with costs that you could then put out as a bid package. So right. A really bad analogy would be like Vetro was like doing your taxes with TurboTax yourself on your computer. And I think Brian is like bringing all your paperwork into the accountant. You know, it, it <laughs> takes a little off our shoulders, I think. And it's a little, I think there's a little reassurance going with, you know, having him involved as well. Hmm. But and now Vetro isn't even- The would do work that the committee really couldn't do effectively. Right. right. So but nobody, said... no, nobody really knows where all the fiber is, right? That's right. No, I think so that would be that. up to Brian to basically be the feet on the ground. Is that right? Yes. So what he says in, his, in the cover letter of the proposal would be, the final product of this initiative will result in a comprehensive report designed to achieve the goal for everyone in the town to have access to reliable, affordable, high speed and future ready internet service. The report will include recommended strategies and related costs for filling gaps in high-speed internet availability, recommended sources of funding to implement the recommended strategies, and all of the data and information that is collected and developed in support of those findings. And he also laid out um, how, the, how the scope of service would work with a kickoff meeting with us, a field audit, identification and validation of potential subscriber locations, a field audit and gap mapping, validation of franchise agreement build out obligations. So going back and looking at the understanding we have with existing providers like Spectrum to say, hey, you, you should have been doing this anyway. Um, he would use a data extraction from Vetro and provide cost estimates and recommendations. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, so it sounds like we should be going before the Board of Selectmen and, and basically ask permission to take this next step, right? Yes. And we've done our, we've done our polling, we've done our community events. Seems like we're ready, right? When's the next 
Board of Selectmen's meeting. Her next one is the is it the twentieth of December. December twentieth. Could we get on the, the the agenda? Yeah. I apologize. I will not be available on December twentieth. I'm having a colonoscopy that day. Ooh, so you know. oh, you'll be out of the hospital by then. <laughs> I will. I hope so. You're more fun on Valium anyway. Exactly. You have Spectrum do that? <laughs> yeah. Next one after Fiber. that is the 6th of January. What's that? January 6th would be the meeting after oh. the 20th. Oh, that's right around the, that's right after. Yeah. When we do you that, we, we don't have to be all jammed with Christmas and. Right. First and third Mondays of each month, unless yep. Monday is a holiday. And I, I think the fact that this committee can point to the public events we've had and that they're available, anyone can watch uh, on YouTube. Um, I think that it, it was kind of a, it's been a long process, but it, it's definitely been valuable and it shows that the work has been put in. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. agree. I thank Kendra, Joe and Kathy and all the folks that made that happen. It was a lot of work. I wonder if we should, um, what our next step of any public meetings should be, Kendra Joe. Is there anybody that, one of the things we talked about early on was uh, reaching out to other towns to see how they have acted and what results they have got. Um, and at this point, I'm wondering about going to towns that have worked with Consolidated and seeing how they've done it, et cetera, so. Including maybe that town in, New Hampshire, you said that was an example of consolidated operating a municipal network? Yeah, so um, I think you have a couple of options. If you wanted to continue with um, information sharing, you can talk to non-incumbents. Um, you can also go down a pathway of, of talking to communities that are working with providers that you're interested in, um, specifically your incumbent providers, right? So. I would say if you wanted to look at a municipally owned consolidated build, then you'd have to go to New Hampshire. Um, the Long, Long Island, while it started out that it would become municipally owned, definitely changed um, and everyone's happy with it, but it did change. So it's no longer municipally owned, but they light up over the next two weeks um, is what Sarah said, just they've been waiting on a piece of equipment to start, They everyone's, connected, they just need to light the system. Um, and so, you know, maybe in a, a month or so, it would be worth having a conversation with that community, someone from the select board, probably someone, and then Mark Green is like the broadband champion in that community um, and could speak to that relationship. I mean, he hounded them for years um, and, and finally got the stars aligned um, for them to finally, you know, move forward with something. Um, but yeah, I'd say there are probably growing, there's a, a growing amount of communities that you could talk to around um, partnerships with either Spectrum or Consolidated. What about uh, Baileyville, Callis, Alexander, that they worked with Down East Broadband? Is that considered a municipally owned system? Yeah, it's a utility. Um, it's a regional open access or um, it is open open access uh, utility, so it's a regional utility district. Okay. So it's not the town. A separate utility entity owns that um, infrastructure. The towns are represented on the board. And so will Casco Bay Consultants. One of the things that we'll get out of that would be as to what direction makes sense for us or what are the options are of being municipally based or, or subsidized in a build out and having it owned by the cable company or whatever it might be? I think it right? depends on what you ask of Brian. Um, I, I, some of his reports, I've seen him list all of the options. Some of his reports, I've seen him just hone in on, on the incumbents. I think it depends on what the community is asking of, of Brian to kind of dig into. Um, so. I don't think more information hurts if by any means, uh, especially where you're holding these public meetings. And, you know, there's a lot of swirl happening around broadband right now, large influx of federal funding, 
the first time we've seen some anti municipally owned um, moves from from um, from providers. Uh, the new authority right so there's definitely opportunities to just set the record straight put out the facts make sure your community is aware of um, the fact that you're actively engaged and looking at broadband as an issue and that um, you're looking at all pathways for this i would just add that the other option is a regional option um i, I don't know that you can completely I don't know that I've heard you say no to that entirely, but it, it definitely is an option just given the fact that there are multiple towns on one island and it's a networked infrastructure. So, you know, maybe that's revisiting a conversation at the League of Towns to say, you know, we've held these conversations, a regional approach, there would be cost savings in the long run um, because of economies of scale, especially if you went with someone like Consolidated, they have three offices where their infrastructure is networked across the entire island. I would say it's, Spectrum is probably similar, um, although I don't think Melinda got into the weeds on any of that. Um, but it's it's definitely another option as more regional efforts take shape across the state. You mentioned utility, regional. Uh, what is what is the difference between, is a utility this kind of third pathway in terms of like, the town owns it, or they stand up a, a technical a company that is owned by the town, but that owns the fiber. Is that the idea? Um, we haven't seen a singular town stand up a utility like a water district, um, broadband esque water district style situation. We have seen it happen when it's multiple towns coming together so to if have we a shared to do, entity. So, if for instance, if the island of Mount Desert decides we, we go to League of Towns, we say, we think there's economies of scale to do a regional thing. That would be a, a utility that was, that is created, like an entity that is created to over to own it. And then that entity farms out the operation and maintenance to a provider. If the towns wanted to own the infrastructure, the towns could also come together to say, we want to leverage our our communities and our participation interests to partner in a private public partnership with pick a provider, consolidated spectrum, et cetera. So, I mean, there's still, regardless of it, if it's regional or singular, you still have to pick your ownership model. Do you own the infrastructure or do you I see. partnership or subsidize uh, a provider to own that infrastructure? Both yep. things can happen. Kendra Joe, how does it work in the communities where, for example, you have spectrum providing fiber to a certain percentage of the population? And if you came along and said, no, we want a municipal own, what happens to those, those places that are already served by spectrum? So in like say Southport, I would take out the word fiber because we haven't seen this happen where spectrum has fiber infrastructure, they've only started to, to build, to say any new builds will be fiber. So I would just clarify that my understanding is that any new build is, is fiber for Spectrum. They aren't going back and upgrading their current customers in that same community to fiber and making it an entire fiber system. They might update some of the kind of central office equipment to provide higher speeds, but you know, say for Kathy, if she doesn't have Spectrum and isn't isn't connected to it, she'll get fiber. But if Matt is currently a Spectrum customer, he'll keep with his he'll keep with his system. Um, he might see some increase and in upgrade, but not the actual to the home um, infrastructure. For so I could see I could see some push pushback on that though, because if I were a customer with Spectrum, and I'm paying the big rates for Spectrum. But if somebody had a municipal plan and was paying maybe a third less, I don't know what it is, I'd be saying, hey, well, how come, you know, I'm paying taxes or whatever. How come I'm not getting getting that plan? Well, it would, wouldn't it be their choice? Like the idea would be that we would have universal access. So we would hope that the take rate could be 100%. It's just up to them. If they're happy with Spectrum, they're going to pay more and pay tax on the on the well, what I'm saying is Spectrum already owns, say, the fiber going to my house. 
right? Well, so I would I, I would say um so that was just a, a spectrum owned expansion example. So for Southport Island, um, who has approved a bond to um, partner with Axiom Technologies, build out their own municipally owned infrastructure, fiber to the premise across the entire community. They are already over 80% covered in spectrum cable service, not fiber, but cable. Um, it's on that community to do the work to get the take rate they need to pay back their bond debt through subscribers. If they don't get the take rate they need and they need 30% to pay back the bond debt, um, to meet the bond debt payment within three years, they need 50% to meet the bond debt payment within one year. Um, in order to meet those standards, they're gonna have to get that take rate. The higher the take rate, the more profit the community seeing that the partnership with Axiom is $30 per customer. So then you're, you're just working to pay back the bond debt. Um, the, you know, in, in, in their model, the tax base approved it, the tax base bonds it, but it is the safety net. Their hope is they'll get a take rate high enough that the subscribers are really paying back that bond debt over the, the 15 to 20 years um, of that debt. Again, I think you, you have to prove that it's better. People don't always under, the average person, my husband does not understand the difference between a fiber service and a cable service. If I said, oh, we're getting fiber tomorrow, he'd be like, great. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't know that he would immediately see the difference or until he actually experienced it, know what it means, um, the reliability and, and pieces like that. Yeah, the, I, may, I might not be explaining myself well, and I apologize, but I'm just yeah. wondering about the nuts and bolts. Like if Spectrum owns the fiber going to my house and I say, I want the municipal. I then you would disconnect right. Spectrum I want to service. Part, what's that? You would call Spectrum. You would say, I no longer want Spectrum service. Right. They would they disconnect to... you. And then you would get a new drop installed by the municipal owned network. For free. So they're, so they're depends able, on what you negotiate. So would you be able to use use their current fiber? So they no. take that down and we put a new one in. Yes. That doesn't that's strange. But anyway. They might yeah, not that's, take it down. that's their owned infrastructure. I mean, and yeah. They, yeah, they might not take it down. They might leave it up because but just you move out of your house and yeah. that person now has an option of town owned and spectrum. Um, but, you know, while they won't take it off your road by any means, your drop might change, but they could also leave it connected to your house. They would take out their equipment inside your house, but they could leave right. it in. Right. No, I understand all that part. I was just. So it sounds like there's this kind of gradient of options where at the far end you have private, the whole thing's private, it's owned by the company, nothing else you can do. Then the next step is public private partnership, um, but it's still owned, I mean, it's still operated by one provider, but this, there's some benefit there for the public. I don't totally understand that. Then there's municipal owned provider operated, and then there's municipal owned municipal operated, which is like, most cities fail on that far end, right? Nobody wants to be their own internet service right. provider. And then, and then the, and then there's also this gradient of, does the town own it or is there uh, a utility created, another some corporate or just legal entity created at a regional level, and that can still be at a public, private, or municipal own, right? Or is that just? I, I, nope. I would add just one more to that if we're digging into all of the models. So the other on the ownership side, um, in Georgetown on Cliff Island, we see an LLC model where it's it's still community driven, but the town just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't move forward on municipally owned and they tried federal funding and just didn't happen. So a, a group of investors came together to form an LLC. The LLC owns the infrastructure, they partner with the town and they partner with the town on affordability. The town will hold an affordability fund. They will support digital literacy and inclusion efforts. Um, they provided letters of support. Um, so they're, they're working kind of not together, but they, they're nice to each other. Um, and then the um, investors contracted out to a provider to light up that system and operate and network manage. 
So that's the, okay. I guess and that's I'll, the third one we see in Maine. And as we move further towards the municipal everything, you we gain more leverage and control and potential payback of the investment. So like in a public private partnership, the town might be investing, but they might not see their return as much or as quickly as if maybe they invested more, they're public, they're totally municipally owned and then they can get a high enough take rate to get that bond paid back. So it becomes more of an asset and they have even more control leverage over the provider for equitable service, priority maintenance. Is that the idea? Like the more we invest as a town, the more control we would have over the operation of that network and the better payback? To an extent, you could invest a lot and consolidate it. They could still own the infrastructure, right? I, I think when you look at the capital stack and, and the ownership, if, if a provider is going to own the infrastructure, it's not that they're going to build it out 100% and not ask the town for any money. Um, even in like in St. George, um, Spectrum supported the community to seek state dollars. They ended up not continuing with the state funding, but the town in that capital stack, it was Spectrum gave a portion. They were seeking grant funding to cover a portion. And then the town itself sought the remaining amount. It wasn't much for St. George and they were just filling in the gaps. It was about $60,000. Um, they chose to do private donation instead of going to the town because the town didn't feel like they could ask taxpayers to just pay for those, you know, 200 people. Um, Westport Island is kind of the opposite. They did a very similar thing, filled in the gaps with Spectrum. Their capital stack is grant funding, Spectrum funded, and town approval. They, I think it was $80,000 the town moved to contribute. Um, so even in the Long Island case, the, the, the change, what change occurred was the town was going to put in $500,000 into the system. Then after the estimates were re-looked at, the design was re-looked at, that number dropped substantially and consolidated said, we'll just cover the, the, the town piece and we'll own it outright. So you can still subsidize just like you had in the past with Spectrum, you subsidized a build to expand to the Pretty Marsh area and all that. That's still uh, absolutely possible. I mean, um, and you could still not see any control or influence. So if we, we have to articulate this situation to the to the town, right? If, if we come up, if we internal internally come up with a recommendation, we're going to have to explain what are the pros and cons, what are the benefits of, and so I think we're going to have to get into some details as to like. What does it mean to have more control over your network? Like, what is the actual end benefit of the customer? Is it, I have a fair price, I have a un more understandable bill, I have better service, you know, whatever these things are, I think we have to get into detail to explain, and we might have to explain the whole gradient, or at least more of the gradient to say, look, here, like, here's one extreme, here's another extreme, here's the balance that we're trying to find, and so that people can kind of get a quick understanding of, what the options are instead of just saying here's the solution take it or leave it uh, i think it would be beneficial because i i'm starting to get the picture a little bit better so thank you kendra joe i really appreciate that but i think we have to kind of simplify and clarify so we can communicate this out and we need to do that first to get a sense of what we want to do but then to, to if we decide we have to go to taxpayers we have a very clear picture what's the benefit to you and this is why we think this is the best choice Mm -hmm. I can forward you all um, what Vinyl Haven shared with their community around the multiple solutions that they brought forward and why they were choosing the one that they chose to present to the select board. So, it was, you know, while we are saying this is the best solution for this community, given all the factors at play, here are all of the options that we had to consider and, and why we didn't. I also think if a committee or a community or select board can set very clear goals or statements like min minimum maximum statements of, you know, we don't, we are, there are towns that say we are not interested in owning anything. That's not a pathway for us. There are towns who say, if we're going to put any money in, we want to own it. Um, and then there's the kind of in-between of we can put in a little bit of taxpayer dollars, but we're not putting in you know, over a certain amount. We, we, you know, based on mill rate, based on debt removal, things like that, 
you know, I, um, I have seen towns just kind of say like, these are our thresholds as a community um, currently and, and where we stand. The other side of that is if your goals are equitable, everyone gets access to the same kind of technology, the same price, uh, the same pricing tiers, the same speed tiers, affordability, um, that there is a low income or, you know, that there is a low income plan. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have a reduction in service. It just because you pay less doesn't mean that you get five over five. Um, so there are those goals that communities should be thinking through and, and trying to set. And I think that helps tailor the solutions. And I think some of your survey could point to that. I think conversations with Matt and the select board can point to that as well um, and, and give you a little clarity as you kind of piece all of this out. I've never seen a community come out of the gate and say, we're owning it no matter what. <laughs> That's Is that where what they Brian can help us to. with? Is that what Brian's going to be able to help us with? Um, not necessarily setting goals, but he can help you with understanding your solution options and the cost. That's what I mean, as those. far as what, you know, because that's what, I mean, I, I agree with Pete, we got to keep this as simple as we possibly can. Okay. You know, and I want somebody that really has a grasp on all of this, that can really make it a, a very simple type of, these are your three options, for example, or whatever, how many options, and this is the pros of, and the cons of each one of these. Mm -hmm. You know, and if that means we pay Brian, see, I'm good at spending Durland's money, but <laughs> that means that we contract him for do, to do a little bit more to come out with that product, I think we're better off. He'll still get you high level estimates. You won't see lower level estimates until you do an RFP. Yeah, yeah. He won't be able to tell you what Spectrum would come back with. He'll be able to give you a high level estimate based on Spectrum's current presence and where they would be filling in the gaps, things okay. like that. And the fact that there would be costs associated with make ready with an on incumbent, there wouldn't be those costs with an incumbent provider, especially one that owns the polls. Mm -hmm. So it's still going to be high level to the point that you get to RFP. RFP would then give you it's still an estimate. It's not the final dollar number, but it would give you a, a much closer number based on those providers. And you could tighten that RFP up as much as you want and say, you know, we specifically want X, Y, and Z or we want your best option for us as a community. And maybe that doesn't include the community subsidizing at all. Maybe it does. Well, and the other thing uh, is to add another layer of confusion is, you know, I think we'd all prefer the regional, a uh, regional approach to this. But when you start talking about that, the decision about the ownership model really might not be up to us. It's, we sort of have to go along with um, what the group wants. So I'm wondering, you know, at some point, we're going to have to make the decision too. We have to have conversations like where is Bar Harbor or Southwest or Tremont or Trent? Where are they in this sort of whole process? And are they interested in moving ahead with us? Because at some point, if they're way behind or not, we might just decide we've got to go it alone, so to speak, which I think we'd prefer to avoid, but it might be the reality. Mm -hmm. I think I you think could take on another five years if we try to do something like, I, I, maybe I'm being right. pessimistic, but. I would say if you're trying to do municipally owned regional, it could add a, a good bit of time. Um, but regionally or a regional collaboration that partnered with a provider that's already an incumbent, that yep. shortens up time quite a bit. Yep. I think if you are also able to get communities to sign on and say, we're willing to consider and, you know, and there's a new broadband intelligence platform, which is Vetro supported, that's rolling out at the state in the next month, you know, utilizing that system and saying, this is our scope, this is where we know the gaps are, we want, and, and setting some standards, and then asking, you could put out an RFP to your incumbents and say, give us your estimate, what would it look like? What would those tier structures be? What would the service be? Um, what would the timeline be? Because I think, they could both leverage their existing service and any investments or upgrades there they have planned for your area. Um, but you would definitely need all of the communities to be taking it seriously and saying we are we are going out and looking for a real regional estimate mm -hmm. from our incumbent or non-incumbent providers. And I think that 
pursuing any regional approach is going to be beneficial in trying to attract county, state, or federal funds to mm, <laughs> in, in lieu of any municipal funds. So that's it might take longer and be cumbersome, but it could also give us a leg up in terms of raising the money. I wonder if we should meet with Brian before we go to the selectmen on in January. Just so that we can clearly articulate what what it is that he'll do for us of what we want him to do for us. I mean, I know we already have a, a price, but you know, after these conversations, is it that we want we want we want more from him? I don't know. Um, if we just looking at timing, if we were to meet with him at our next meeting, that would be the is that the second Thursday in January, which would be just before the second meeting of the Board of Selectmen in January. We would miss the January 6th meeting is what I'm thinking. What I was thinking is, is have another meeting. Before January 6th? Right. And, and I have have him to get to another community meeting, but just let me know via email if you need anything else from me and I'll see you all next time. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. much. If you could send that vinyl Thank everything, that would be great. Yes, I can do that. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, and by the way, I my wife is due for uh, another baby in like four to five weeks. So I think I'm going to be not available in January. Aww. Oh, well, Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. What a flimsy excuse for not joining this. I know. <laughs> Baby <Ooh>. duty. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, Scott, were you thinking maybe we invite him to a meeting and have him walk through in person what his proposal would be so we can ask him questions directly? Yeah. And, and what we're, some of the things we're grappling with, you know, as to what option we go with. And he, if he says, hey, I can help you with that, but it extends the scope of what I'm doing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah, know maybe he I... says, I'm not your guy for this. You should go to somewhere else right. for that aspect. You know, it would be good to get a sense of the boundaries of his sweet spot. <laughs> uh, when do you think a meeting might be possible for all of us? I'm pretty flexible this time time of day, pretty much any time, but. Um, should we shoot for one day next week? Go on, let me look. The only, oh yeah, next week. I, I could do Tuesday, Wednesday, Oh, here I, I said I'm pretty flexible. I can only do Tuesday, or Wednesday next week. <laughs> okay. I could I could potentially do either of those. Me too. What I'll have to do is let's set a time on that, and I'll make sure that doesn't conflict with anything else. Remember, we can only run one meeting, so unless you want to run it on one of your platforms, like. Ah, okay. Like if you wanted to, to sponsor it, Kathy, that way we could yes. avoid having to, to look at my calendar as far as okay. the time goes. So I, Tuesday, Wednesday, either one of those is fine for me. It doesn't make any difference. So that would be the 14th or 15th. Do you want me to reach out to Brian and see about that? Yeah, see what he can do. Okay. That'll be good. That would get Pete before his child, right? Yes, exactly. We can, so we can take full advantage of Pete while we can. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be asleep at the Zoom for many months. <laughs> <laughs> so the 14th or 15th around 4 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. And just so you know, on the 15th, there is an NTIA funding session going on. So it is from the federal government and... I don't even remember what NTIA is for, but it is this 
you know, national something or other, but has to do with all of this and how you might get funding for broadband services. So that's at 2.30 on the 15th. Um, that's a Zoom meeting? It is a Zoom meeting, yes. Well, it's actually a go-to webinar meeting, but it is a, um, and it goes you, from 2.30 to four. And is there a link or something for that or? Uh, there, you know, I had to sign up for it and I'm not sure if I can share it, but I will look into it and. Um, but I'd be interested, maybe I can pop over and watch it with you or something. Okay. I All assume right. you're gonna watch it from your office or? Yes, yes yeah. I would be. Okay, Two all right, I'll, I'll look into that. So, all right, I will reach out to Brian and see if he can do that and happy to host it from my own Good. Zoom session if necessary. So. Decomplicates things considerably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have anything else? Now, Kathy, I'm supposed to not end the Zoom call, right? Let it. Um, I can. think you can if end the meeting, but let, but don't quit Zoom. Okay, and then I have to go up to the recording and say to cloud or something or? Uh, it, well, I think when you're ready, it, it says recording, but you probably yep. have something in the top left that has yep. like double vertical lines and then a square. Yeah. And if you hit the square, that will stop the recording and it will ask you if you want to stop the recording. And okay, then- I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it right now, okay? okay. Just to, 